I want you people to watch closely this tape that Andy Kaufman sent in. Then I got some else to say. Can we watch okay. this? Let's roll it now and take it. Mr. Lawler, I've heard all these things you've been saying about me on television. You want to wrestle me? You want to wrestle me, my for style? All right, fine. I'm not afraid of you, Mr. Lawler, because let me tell you something. True, I only wrestle women, but I've wrestled women that are a lot bigger and stronger than you. Matter of fact, they're probably smarter than you because you don't have any brains. You're from Memphis, Tennessee. All you do is plow the fields and farm and the farm and the... Uh, is that how you talk to Memphis, Tennessee, Mr. Lawler? Boo. See, Mr. Lawler, you don't have any brains. I am from Hollywood. I have the brains. That's how I win my matches. I say the bigger they come, the harder they fall. You might be twice as big as me, but I've wrestled women that are twice as big as me, and I've mopped the floor with them. And that's what I'm going to do with you, Mr. Lawler. You challenged me to a wrestling match. I think you bit off a little more than you can chew. I'm going to wipe the floor with you, Mr. Lawler. I'll give you a little sample. This is what's going to happen when you and I wrestle each other in Memphis. Hi, I'm Jeremy. I'm a dork living in Portland, Oregon, who spent too many years listening to podcasts and not doing anything creative. This is my attempt to rectify that, to create and contribute something where I talk to people about their cultural obsessions and try to give some recommendations of my own. Welcome to Giving the Mic to the Wrong Person. And you are listening to Giving the Mic to the Wrong Person. I am your host, Jeremy. Join me. It's been a... Uh, it's been a little bit of a time since our last recording session, but wanted to bring back my two guests here. Uh, heard on the uh, our previous episode in our group rant about idiotic trends in online fandom. Uh, I am joined today by. I'm Natasha Foxley. I am just a nerd, I guess. Uh, I'm Garrett Burt, on air personality. That's what I said last. Time. Yeah, I like that. Um, I'm a country singer who has. Uh, country music credentials no, I, don't, I don't know <laughs> the credentials part uh, but i can talk about stuff and and if i can i just ask a bunch of questions and i'm your host jeremy hi how you doing so um uh, to get back to our what were you we just ranting about after um uh, uh oh uh snl comedies and wayne's world in particular mm -hmm. my favorite thing about wayne's world especially watching it now is you realize that Ed O'Neill is the be is the does the best performance in the entire film. He, he is the best he line. is the funniest thing in that movie. I'd never done a crazy thing in my life before that night. Why is it if a man kills another man in battle, it's called heroic? Yet if he kills a man in the heat of passion, it's called murder. Hello, what do you think you're doing? Only me and Garth get to talk to the camera. And it's one. Of and the he's just such a good actor. Like you, you when you see him do that bit, it's like, man, this guy is good at this. You know what I mean? He's the guy that's good at being super intense, and it's somehow hilarious for some reason. Anyway, yeah. go on. I think the other that was kind of thing where he was always, almost like, we lost. <laughs> I want to say we we lost. Um, it's this similar to how we never had Muhammad Ali fight in the peak or. I guess to a lesser extent, Mike Tyson. We never had Muhammad Ali fight in the very peak of his ability because he was banned from he was, um, mm -hmm. he was yeah. banned from boxing. I think we'd lost years with Ed O'Neill as non, you know, because that because he was so typecast, mm -hmm. he was so typecast from his sitcom role yeah. that, um, e pig. Um, <laughs> New that's big. yeah. Talk about a formative show. Oh my god. Yeah, but he was so yeah, typecast. Well, as, he was so typecast as as that show that he couldn't do. Like I said, it was just kind of like a. It was what you know, like a surprise hit, and um, like he couldn't really do anything else for like forever until yeah. like years later after he got like freaky swole and hung out with the Gracies and got really into like <laughs> no know about that. he got no the, the, watch him now. Watch, I mean, even on the years on no, Modern he's Family, huge. he's like he's he, a beast of a man. I'm just, he's. Yeah, really? he, he is friends with the Gracies, and he got really, really into MMA in the previous like fifteen years. Oh my god! And actually, I don't know how how. But he was always a fit dude. Yeah, he was a fit yeah. dude, but not. But he now was a massive guy, and yeah, he got huge. Like when you watch that American Family show, he's like, oh, I haven't watched it. Hella yoked. Yeah. Modern Family. Sorry, I always call it um, American <laughs> Family, but it, the same is American Family. No, that show's called American Dad. There's American Dad. There's also. Um, 
Was it called American? Was it called My American? What was Margaret Cho's show called? Oh, uh, it was called like wasn't it just called like Modern American Gal or something like? Or American that? American Gal? Yeah, mm-hmm. it was. It was. Yeah, I don't know. I don't think it was very good though. It was. I I only remember. I remember, and I think she's hilarious. I want to go on the record. She's I remember a great seeing stand up comedian. Yeah. But. I remember seeing a couple episodes of it, and I remember at one point because it was definitely that that time uh, in nineties pop culture, Quentin Tarantino played her boyfriend on the show. Oh Are my you God. kidding me? I am not. I can show you. Uh, I can do it. Dwarf goes auto racing is great. He's brilliant in this one. I am too short to see over the dashboard. <laughs> that reminds me of something. So I've been watching the Gilmore Girls with um, with my lady friend, mm-hmm. and uh, I saw an episode the other day, and it was uh, and uh, Seth MacFarlane was in it. The the the, oh, yeah. uh, the Family Guy guy. He was on Star Trek name? too. Seth yeah, he, Farland, he, he Farland, was yeah. on like I, he's been on he's been on several episodes of Star Trek, which is really hilarious to me to see when he does like that. But that lithium matrix has got to be aligned within 0.3 microns. The specs say 0.5. Who do you think wrote those specs? A warp field specialist? Exactly. Some guy who's probably never been outside the solar system. I've spent the last three and a half years crawling inside one of these engines. I know what I'm talking about. I sir. On what, Enterprise. On on Enterprise. Okay, yeah, because yeah, that was the that was the era when it <laughs> that's what, that was yeah, once you hit late night once um once the syndication model was set for you know, from uh from D S nine on out, uh-huh. especially when they were um I think DSI was the transitional period, but because de- definitely once you got into the Voyager and Enterprise era, mm-hmm. to the point where Voyager, I mean, hell, uh, as I've mentioned before on a previous episode of the show, Voyager had the rock on for, because they, it was right when UPN was broadcasting WWF SmackDown and they figured, hey, let's have a little, um, synergy. Yeah, oh, yeah. a little, like, network yeah. synergy. Yeah. Okay, so this is when the rock was already the rock. Yes, this yeah. w- this would have been between ni- this was like ninety nine two thousand. So this was this was not when this was yeah this was not when uh, he was still Rocky Maivia, and <laughs> okay when but this was yeah this was after his heel turn and his and I believe after he left the Nation of Domination, um, one of uh, one of Vince McMahon's um, eh, let's just say odd attempts at having a. Uh, this was this is all like late nineties WWF Attitude Era. Oh yeah. Well, sorry, folks. You you just missed the the other, the shrug from everybody else in the room as I go into <laughs> sorry, as I go into like ninety you know late nineties <laughs> WWF Errata about even the era before like I started watching wrestling again. I love it. Even um, when I watched wrestling, I don't think I could say that much about it. Yeah, I, don't I remember, remember like any of it. I liked the Ultimate Warrior a lot. Uh, but we you, all loved Hulk Hogan. As I just children, I so. love I love that people love wrestling so mm-hmm. much and I kind of am jealous cuz I want to yeah. like, get into it but I just I think it's coming back into style too is my I think yes yeah, I don't think it ever left Oh that's true no, yeah. no I don't think it ever became unfashionable there's always a dude that's like I love this yeah. you know It comes in waves the street fight guys for example <laughs> but I think because I think the um Especially during the during the, I don't know when the transition period was, but I think it was definitely in the aughts. It kind of went during the the weird like, thanks to um, thanks to you know booking and the and their kind of the stars that they had at the time. They were still kind of they always go through floundering periods. Like for example, the early nineties when Vince was very very close to going to jail and being investigated because he would share roids with oh Macho my. Man and and Ooh, Hogan. Yeah. And, and Macho Man, um, he was. It was obvious he was. There was something wrong with that guy, in my opinion. Macho Man, nothing Randy. Nothing means nothing. Nothing means nothing. Man. Nothing means nothing. What do you oh, mean by that? Boy, I'm talking about all the way to the top. Yeah, unjustifiably in a position that I'd rather not be in. But the cream will rise to the top. Oh yeah. But it, if you look. In look well, what, like I said, Macho Man was gifted enough, one of the rare gifts, much like with Ric Flair, and that he could be he was one of the best guys on the mic ever, but also one of the he could be one of the best guys in the ring. Mm-hmm. He he 
they meticulously planned it out, but he was one of the two guys who were, who participated in what was for the longest time regarded as like the greatest match ever in uh, ever in, in WWF history was like him and Ricky the Dragon Steamboat at WrestleMania three, where they went for twenty five thirty minutes for the Intercontinental Belt, and just like this knockdown drag out thing that we watched watched it as a twelve or thirteen year old with uh, with in our in our in our house, uh, you know, pay per view live watching WrestleMania three. But the, the the kicker about, and this is a good enough, this is a good enough um, this is a good enough um, transition point. But it's like, and I I think I have probably mentioned. Well, I know my knowing. I only talk about so many celebrities, so I know I've mentioned this on previous shows. But I think that fandom is not required. But I think a um, I think a knowledge of the mechanics of how pro wrestling works, and more importantly, how kayfabe mm-hmm. works, is critical to understanding. Um, American political pop culture, political culture oh, especially. Interesting. Yeah. So this 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 term kayfabe is new to my lexicon, but it's it is uh, well, if you understand it, so just explain it. Have you ever heard of the term kayfabe? No, I haven't. This is a new thing for me. This is uh, spelled uh, K A Y F A B E. Okay. It the, because pro wrestling and then the, you know. Uh, corrections can be sent to uh, Garrett at Garrett.com. <laughs> yeah, send them there. Um, I'm, sure, because I'm pro- sure whoever has <laughs> who has that email is going to be very upset. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because pro wrestling started as a carny thing in mm-hmm. the, in you know late uh, late you know in 19th century early 20th, they adopted a lot of carny speak. Oh, and so in carny and kayfabe was what you is. There's a huge Wikipedia article and like far better I'm deline- to read it. far better delineations on it, but it was kind of a thing where kayfabe is like, um, say in character, uh, you know, you are you are lying, not necessarily like- lying, but you are you are like in character talking. Mm-hmm. It's like it's like think inter in world, in world continuity. Okay, so it's sort of like a, it- it's like a, a variation of LARPing. I'm thinking, right? Like, well, it's is it the pre- I thought of it as like sort of the pretend tough talk. You okay, know what yes. I mean, yeah. it's like okay. like yeah. Natasha's my enemy. Yes. And I'm gonna get into the mm-hmm. ring with her, and I am the cream in the World Wrestling Federation. Wait, wait a minute, there is no doubt about it. Yeah, you mean Gene Oakland. You know that I'm the cream of the crop. Oh. Destroy. I don't know, it, you know, and you're going to be on my side, and you know what I mean. Yeah. Like it's the sort of like it's sort of sort of like stump speeching if we're okay. gonna, if we're going to put yeah. it on right. on a political footing. Stump speeching, but stump speeching with even more uh, emphasizing the constructed reality. Uh-huh. Right. The it's, it's one of the things I'm surprised. Well, I know why because of class associations. Why like Adam Curtis and like fully just di- dove in head first into this concept. Yeah. Because like all of his documentaries talk about this anyway. Well, maybe the Chapo guys like hipped him to it, and maybe his next one will be about kayfabe. One hopes so. There are there are enough there there are, there are enough uh, pro wrestling uh, podcasts and shows in, he was in England. A man called Jerry Jeff Lawler. Did you hear Wait. the the Street Fight Radio where they were talking about <laughs> wrestling and the guy that said he quit? Listen, you know, is it WWE? Is that what it was? I with don't the, know. With the McMahon's because the McMahon's contributed to Trump's campaign. Is that right? Yeah, like huge amounts. Of money. There, there's a reason why Linda. One of the there's a reason. The, there are multiple reasons why Linda McMahon is now the current, um, so secretary department head of the Small Business Administration. Yeah, she she's a she's a major government. Uh, figure now, yeah, wow. could not get elected. Uh, lost two Senate campaigns. Yeah, she tried to run in like New Hampshire or something. Connecticut, Connecticut. Okay, w, uh, Titan Towers and WWE has always been where, based someplace where posh white people live. Well, in New York suburbanites. Yeah, like it's where I mean, like Letterman always lived in Connecticut. Mm-hmm. WWE slash Titan Towers, Titan Sports Incorporated, the uh, you know their eighties corporate thing was always based in Stanford, Connecticut, because you could you know train ride from manhattan there and back yeah. mm-hmm. um she ran for senate twice the the hilarious thing is go online and google you can google it you can see um campaign lit of her um of like with like her picture on it and like obama's picture of it even though she was running for the gop seat in connecticut of like talking about how like you know the, the her shared goals with Obama. This is like the two, I think like the 2012 oh election or something like that. 2012, 2012, 2014. I remember her running, um, 
But hey, let's can we go back to kayfabe? Yeah. But well, sure. just to finish up, okay. Linda McMahon donated seven million dollars to the Trump campaign. Bought her much like with Betsy DeVos and any number of the like, seven million dollars. Yeah. Or I, I believe that was the number reported. I just want to say, for the record, I want to live in a society where no one has seven million dollars to give to a political campaign. Or that's that all. we that's can all. have an you know a private individual giving to a yeah. The uh, it's it, <laughs> as uh, as Amber Ailey Frost once said, it's not so much that um, you know what you know why why don't we have more women billionaires? The question should be why do we have billionaires? Why at all? do we have yeah, billionaires? Exactly. Why do we allow billionaires to this exist? This is not good. This is not good fight for representation. But, there. but Warren Buffett's such a great guy. Oh God! I mean, he gives a lot of money away. Uh, um, which is actually so it's, sick we, of that shit. <laughs> which is true. I mean, he does eat for you know it's, it's Warren Buffett and George Soros could be complete assholes with their money, but at least. They are they are because they are I think they're targeted because they they are not complete assholes with their yeah. money, and um, I should cut some, them some slack, but I just hate a society where they're like where where we lionize charity mm-hmm. and we and we um we you know pejoratively or or we talk down about just being poor. You yeah, know what I mean? Like, exactly. Uh, like we don't we shouldn't need these people to be charitable. We should just have a society where people are taken care of. Anyway, yeah. the old the the old quote which showed up i believe in one of the civilization games i think it was either four or five but what was the quote is like when i give food to the poor they call me a saint when i ask why the poor have no food they call me a communist Mm. yeah i mean that's 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 about what i'm talking about yeah the um but okay back to kayfabe so yeah Mm -hmm. um probably should have prepared for this but you know you can't prepare for these things i have a question will that do you think it might be helpful for me to ask a question feel free so so kayfabe is from my understanding it's 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 a way of sort of uh it's it's a way of play acting in, in which you have a sort of um you know you have two parties or more that are uh um at at battle with each other yeah. and, you know ideologically or something but they all know that the the rules are that we're just pre- we're playing pretend yep. and and is that Pant- what you're is pantomime. that the, yeah yep. yeah it's pantomime and is that the is that the comparison you're drawing with modern politics where it's like these are all people basically of the same sort of as as Thomas Frank refers to it the managerial professional class they all know the rules and it's just a matter of how they posture Mm-hmm. And how they position themselves within, but they're all they all hang out. They all go to the same parties. You know what I mean? Like yeah. like, like all the professional wrestlers do as well. Yeah, the, it's it's not like the like the bad guys in professional wrestling are like, oh nah, man, we're not going to go have dinner yeah. with you know whoever the good guys are. I'm sorry, I don't know any wrestlers. No, it's 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 driving people's love of seeing two opposing things and picking which side they're on. But basically, what I'm asking is that a uh, a decent approximation of how kayfabe. Uh, 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 relates to modern politics part of it okay so i pick up roland bar and uh, there was a couple of things about these roles and, and about you know the the nature of the theater and what it satisfied and i found this to be you know interesting and i'm glad i did the reading i will quote him now as soon as the adversaries are in the ring, the public is overwhelmed with the obviousness of the roles. As in the theater, each physical type expresses to excess the part which has been assigned to the contestant. So right away, you're like, that's the bad guy. That's the good guy. Now that bad guy's got to pay or whatever the, 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 you know, and however much you have invested in the particular character. I mean, there are several different types of heel. There are, there are a few different types of face and, and you get attached to these conflicts and you get attached to these characters and how they're portrayed by specific wrestlers. See, I never knew that. I never really took into that. For me, it was always like, it's fake. Who gives a shit? Because I'm unable to connect to, uh, to what I see as a charade. I, I tend to gravitate and need something real. I wish and now, in retrospect, it's the same uh, way I feel about animation. I wish that I could connect and feel these feelings. I'm having a little more luck with animation now. But he goes on to speak. Uh, this is more Bart. 
It is obvious that it's such a pitch, it no longer matters whether the passion is genuine or not. What the public wants is the image of passion, not passion itself. There is no more a problem of truth in wrestling than in the theater. In both, what is expected is the intelligible representation of moral situations which are usually private. This exhaustion of the content by the form is the very principle of triumphant classical art. Wrestling is an immediate pantomime, infinitely more efficient than the dramatic pantomime, for the wrestler's gesture needs no anecdote, no decor, in short, no transference in order to appear true. It's the fulfilling of desire of, of justice and, and of comeuppance and the stringing along of that tension. But you know it's going to be relieved. Where else can you find that? In term, you know, uh, uh, related anecdote, and um, hopefully I won't get, I won't lose the thread. It was a major, relatively major scandal in terms because it broke kayfabe. When you talk about how, like, you know, pro wrestlers, as like with like campaign journals and politicians, go to the same parties, it was a relative scandal because it broke kayfabe. You break kayfabe where you pierce the mm-hmm. reality of, much like in, you know, much like in the. Um, I think it was in what uh, Jodorowsky's Holy Mountain, where they pull back to show that you're watching. You know, the, the camera pulls back and it shows the the all of the um, it shows like all of you know the the, the set crew, the film crew mm-hmm. filming a scene before it goes back in. Breaking the fourth wall. Yeah. If we have not obtained immortality, at least we have obtained reality. We began in a fairy tale and we came to life, but is this life reality? No. It is a film. Zumba camera. We are images, dreams, photographs. We must not stay here, prisoners. We shall break the illusion. This is Maya. That kind of thing, same thing in 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 the epic Jean Claude Van Damme JCVD during his monologue scene where he goes up into the uh, stage lights and then come back down. Uh. The, like I said, breaks kayfabe. The uh, a minor scandal was in the early nineties when uh, um, when they they uh, you had current you know you had enemies. Uh, Hacksaw Jim Duggan and the Iron Sheik were in the same car driving to a match and got <gasps> pulled over and busted for possession. <gasps> oh my God! They were sharing drugs together. <laughs> uh, was it just marijuana? Yeah, it was just was it? Mar- okay. no, it was a lot of marijuana. Oh. Yeah, a lot of it. And this is like in the early Dude. '90s, and it's kind of that, there. But the aspect. I'm of so the- glad that Hacksaw Jim Duggan got hella blazed. You know what yep. I mean? He, I, I, no, he's still there. He lost a kidney. Uh, I think he lost a kidney, came back, was but wrestled for way too long. I saw him, I saw him wrestle a live horrible match in Flint, Michigan at, for WCW where, uh, where Kurt Hennig, who was AKA Mr. Perfect, like deliberately. Oh, I remember Mr. Perfect. Visibly said, you know, he just waved it. He's like, ah, oh, screw this match. Cause he, the, the other guy was, um, but because Haxel Jim Duggan was blowing so many moves and blowing so many spots, just mm. screwing up everywhere that he just kind of like tossed out and then he just did like a roll up and they just, they ended the match right there because he's like, oh, you know, this is it. We are done. Yeah. This dude's washed up. Yeah. Part of, like I said, kayfabe comes from carny speak. Mm-hmm. When you have, when they talk about like, say, smarts and marks, cause a mark was always a person, I guess. Um, when, the, when you have like, when they got, you know, you have like the, the wealthy family showing up to the, the posh family showing up to the carnival to see all of the, uh, mm-hmm. you know, come to the sideshow, come to see the animals. And mm-hmm. you have the, the bar, you know, the carnival barker or the, even like the, um, the carnival owner himself would be at the front. Like, oh, you know, would see like, you know, this guy pulling money out of his wallet or whatever mm-hmm. and would, uh, you know, had, uh, chalk the fingers. And it's, you know, and he would extend his hand, you know, extend the non chalk hand. It's like, sir, you know, I want to welcome you to such and such, you know, local podunk carnival, and he, and you know, go for, go for the the art. And uh, I'm this is this is making for great radio. I love it. Reach his arm around the back of the guy, 
tap him, you know, tap the guy on the tap the rich gentleman on his back and leave a little chalk mark. So he was a mark, so that everybody, everybody at the uh, at the site, and I'm probably getting this wrong, but whatever, you know, uh, email your corrections to Garrett. <laughs> everybody uh, at the, you know, all the people who Garrett at, you know, at Garrett dot com. Yes, all the people there knew that this guy was a sucker. He was a yeah. rube. He was a, uh, and it's the part of kayfabe is you are fooling the marks. Yeah, it is the. Um, it is that it is it is positioning the reality, this 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 um, this it's, you know dare I say simulacrum, this this fake reality and onto people. But you know it's like people who really really you know who there we go perfect kayfabe, uh, Jerry Lawler and Andy Kaufman. Uh, day before yesterday, I get a knock on my door and a man delivers me a videotape and this, which is a deposition. From, given to a lawyer and a court reporter from uh, Andy Kaufman, and apparently uh, I'm being sued by Andy Kaufman now. And I just want to well, show you this, show you this <laughs> tape, tape from Andy Kaufman. If you want to look at this, okay. can you can you yeah. run this? Yeah, let's, this here is here it is. Thing you remember me? I'm Andy Kaufman from Hollywood. Remember, you pushed me around in the ring last time I was down in Memphis, Tennessee. Well, let me tell you something, Mr. Lawler. I am not a hick. I am not from Memphis, Tennessee. I don't come from Tennessee like you do, okay? I come from Hollywood, California, where I make movies and TV shows. Mm, right. and Andy Kaufman implicitly understood kayfabe and how it worked. And like, and this is before, and this is uh, when he got involved with, you know, like I said, I think it was in the movie. And mm-hmm. but it, when he got involved with Memphis, uh, with what is it? Yeah, Mid South Wrestling. Yeah. At the at the in the in the Memphis Coliseum, he like I said got it completely, and the entire thing was, um, the you know like I said the entire thing was like him working with, uh, you know, <laughs> Jimmy Mouth of the South Mouth of the South Heart and Love Jerry Lawler. Dude. Yeah, Jerry Jerry Lawler to do these matches. I am a national television star, and I want the respect that I deserve when I come down to Memphis. And I don't like any hick like you pushing me around in the ring. I never agreed to wrestle you. I was wrestling someone else. You stuck your nose in. You came in the ring. You pushed me around, and now you know what I'm going to do? But it's, you had, you had, like I said, it was you had a lot of people. I think it's overwhelmed how many people were like, you know, this is all real. Mm-hmm. You know, versus like realizing that this is this is this is live action theater. Okay, because yeah. I want to talk about that then, because my my notion is that most you know almost everyone except I would imagine children don't take wrestling seriously insofar as they believe these are real antagonisms between between these larger than life characters. Yeah. Yes, is that true then? So so that I mean, the nature of kayfabe has moved on. That you still don't break kayfabe or whatever, but. But everyone knows you're. It's just posturing. You know what I yeah. mean? Is that, does that make sense? Yeah. I think that there there are times. Usually, they never break reality. The uh, uh, you know where um, sometimes you will um, you will sometimes, especially thanks to the it, when, once the internet became a thing, and because the the opposite of a mark was the smart. Mm-hmm. The smart tap 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 the head. Mm-hmm. The smart knew, you know, was hep to it and knew knew the mechanics, and you could be smartened up uh, by under, by being shown explained like, okay, here's you know, here's here's a, your two guys. Okay, the bad guy he's he was the heel. The good guy is the baby face or the face, and they, they you know they have a blow off match and they wrestle and do whatever. And um, you know, like I said, but illust- it's kind of like illustrating the mechanics of like how this show, how this theatrical show went. Yeah. And of course, and then, but and the, but the the internet helped it a lot. But the it wasn't until I think in like the nineties when you had people who you know who you know who grew up on the 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 modern the well the eighties modern pro wrestling boom who were but who were like effectively my age. Mm-hmm. So you were you know you had already graduated from high school or in college when like the ninety when the nineties like the ECW um, Steve Austin. Uh, the Attitude Era, as what is now called, which yeah. is like late '90s through about 2001, mm-hmm. where you had the Monday Night Wars, where WCW Monday Nitro was going against WWF uh, Monday Night Raw. Like you know, when the when the Rock and Mick Foley were there, but sometimes they would actually break. I think there was a there was a very famous episode of WWF where Vince McMahon said to you know, open the show by talking to the camera, saying that they were you know out of character, that you know we're going to start. 
you know, letting people know we're not going to do, we're not going to, we're not going to do like the safe family stuff anymore. We're going to start, you know, we're going to start aiming for uh, older kids. Oh wow! Or for older folks. Okay. Mm-hmm. That was a break in kayfabe. Grandparents. Yeah. I'm just kidding. That too. We also think that you're tired of the same old simplistic theory of good guys versus bad guys. Surely the era of the superhero who urged you to say your prayers and take your vitamins is definitely passe. Therefore, we've embarked upon a far more innovative and contemporary creative campaign that is far more invigorating and extemporaneous than ever before. <laughs> grand, grand, well, grandparents were always a fan of it. My my dad, because you had wrestling at the I, at the IMA uh, in Flint, Michigan. My What's dad, the IMA? The IMA was the building. Um, I think, God, what was it? Like the industrial was it the the either was the, it basically a convention center it was an it was an okay. arena it was the it was like the im arena and i can't remember what it was called okay, but that's it was fine. it was but it was a big you know big sports hall you know mm-hmm. b- boxing matches and such yeah uh-huh at in in flint michigan and my dad would probably be, sat like three thousand people or something yeah about yeah, that okay yeah like i said this is my um we're painting a picture for the list oh, very just, much my memory is all of the t- tacoma dome going to see uh monster trucks smell yeah. smell the 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 cloud of cheap beer and probably mm-hmm. at the time cigarettes because mm-hmm. you could probably smoke in that building oh as yeah well. this is the, yeah my, my father talked to tell stories about uh great grandma uh, about grandma Cosset coming and they would always sit in the corner and grab and like i said it was still real to grandma Cosset, and all the workers oh. all the wrestlers knew do not go to that corner because there was a there was a lady there who will who is there with her umbrella <laughs> uh, and, her, and her patch bag who like i said who will no, not, not not just poking people but just kind of like full-on like like bloom county style just wagging yeah. people over the head and so, they would so she'll hit people like like uh like a laughing character oh. or something yes like, no she, when the heels when so, she can, can i mention something more irrelevant to young people than laughing by the way like, oh uh, <laughs> yeah kids if you if you if kids if you liked how say uh everything from sesame street to you can't do that on television to god whether well, shows are based on laughing uh, Sesame Street, you can't do it on television. There's also there's a couple other shows that are very much laughing. I mean, but, I think if you liked Austin Powers, you should watch Laughing just to just to see kind of where he got some of those ideas. Oh you yeah, know? and it's and and where and again, thanks to Laughing being a a, a recurring feature on Nick at Night in the late '80s. Mm-hmm. That's which, why I know what it is. That's why I know what it is. We would watch we would watch Laughing, and then we'd turn on and we'd then we'd switch over and we'd watch Arsenio Hall, and then we'd switch, and then Arsenio <laughs> would go it would. We'd go f- go from laughing to Arsenio, then we'd watch Letterman. Mm-hmm. That sounds like a great. Night. You're listening to old guy well, talk I, who I'm, watched I lots am, of TV. You know, um, by the time I watched Nick and Knight, it was I Dream of Jeannie, Bewitched, and uh, you know, sometimes right. Which is like when when we were watching Nick and yeah. Knight, those shows were still in regular syndication, <laughs> so you could just watch them on your local TV station yeah. at like mm-hmm. s- six o'clock. Yeah, you know, before the news came on. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah, and then we would watch like Donna Reed and Laughin and My Three Sons and mm-hmm. like all the things. Like my my dad was a child. Dobie Gillis. Dobie Gillis. Yeah, my dad was a child in the fifties into the early to mid sixties, and like those were the shows that he liked to yeah. watch. And then wow, it just shifts up, man. It's like it how there's no there's no such thing as an oldie station. Like now, an oldie station plays like the Bee Gees mm-hmm. and not like the 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 Drifters or something like that. Yeah. Anyway, remember when all these stations were just, you know, like, did you guys know that time moves forward? Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) No, don't tell me. I don't like it. Uh, Anyway, your grandma hit people at the wrestling match. Great grandma, but yes. Yeah. Okay. And, um, well, I think, but the, just the importance of kayfabe being of a, a, um, a, a constructed reality that everybody, all the participants know is we, is, is completely constructed, but they are they are all acting to the audience because mm-hmm. it's the kayfabe. You you can't have kayfabe without marks, without rubes, mm-hmm. without the uh, you know all the punters in the crowd um, performing to them that this is all you know this is all this you know th- what you are watching now is real. Yeah, isn't that the success of reality television in our last twenty years too? Like it's we know that it's a constructed reality, but we all kind of pretend like it. Exists? Yeah, like there's so many, especially the lower rent, like sort of uh, um, basic cable stuff. Yeah, yeah, basic cable stuff where where they're like, what, what, uh, you know, what crazy situation oh, has God, so yeah. and so gotten into this week? Yeah. And it's like we're all supposed to believe 
that that's something that just organically happened rather than there's like a production team that makes these things. Why is she working at an ice cream factory? She's such yeah. a prima donna, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Or whatever it exactly. is, you know. Or like, look at you. Know, uh, how, how are these people finding out all these great treasures in these, yeah, in these exactly. locked up, in, yeah. these, <laughs> in these locked up storage lockers like well, on a regular basis? Who would have thought, you know? Yeah, yeah. they're just accidentally finding. Oh, yeah. Like, like my favorite is, um, uh, what's that one? Uh, American Pickers. Have you guys mm, watched that one? No. My parents love that. So I, I, I actually really enjoy watching it. But the, one of the funniest things about it is nobody on that show has any charisma. And oh, really? Yeah. But the, the the whole premise of the show is that they accidentally are just driving around in like the sticks, and they find some guy. You know, so everyone knows a guy probably has a family member that's like a guy that just collected a bunch of weird shit. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And he's got like two acres, and it's just all just filling that up. And, yeah. it's, always, and it's always in a barn. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's always in some barn. Uh, my dad was kind of that guy. He actually had a big aluminum barn that that he used for other things, but then eventually just became a repository mm-hmm. for like his Wheeler Dealer uh, stuff. But anyway, the, mm-hmm. just that show cracks me up because. Again, they have no charisma. These they they're very dull people and Yeah. That does not make good television. You have to set that up. <laughs> well, I don't know. I don't know why I went on that jag and I'm sorry. Oh, but, it's okay. Uh, my, my one comment on American Pickers where if it's the if it's the if it's the two guys that I'm thinking of, they always struck me as immediately uh immediately before the cameras were rolling, they did they just inhaled God knows how many stimulants. <laughs> And you know, just did full on, just as much as right. much, as much powder as possible. Mm-hmm. Then clicked on the cameras and turned on the mics and started like rap, speaking faster than even I do on caffeine. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> it's always like we're in Scranton this week, yeah. and we found what we think is a real treasure trove, and we're ready to pick. You know, oh my god, and, and it's and because yeah. they all, uh, at least on whatever channel that American Pickers is on. Oh. Everyone talks the same yeah. on every reality show. Oh. It's always well, this. Well, and it's spread to everything. Think of all the home and garden shows that are like that. Like, <laughs> it's all like bullshit. I'm like, uh, yeah, sorry. So I save all that stuff for when I'm staying in a hotel. Mm-hmm. And then I, that's all I do is I'll just, just I'll, I'll get done doing whatever I'm doing uh, that's, you know, mm-hmm. related to me being in a hotel. And then I go to the hotel and be like, American pickers for the next two and a half hours. That's it's kind of a thing where like visiting visiting the parents for for holidays. Oh yeah, because my folks, uh, my my folks, they mainly watch their uh, because their sitting chairs are also in their in their master bedroom with the big TV, big wall screen, and they'll click that on, and like a bunch of us just kind of sit around and and well, like I'll be I'll be there, you know, like playing phone games or second screen stuff, and yeah. they'll lot you know. Every damn night. Um. <laughs> oh God, yeah. They have that. The TV is always on. There's always commercials. Uh, my my parents. Oh, commercials, like, right? I know. I don't see them anymore because I don't have. If you people. don't go watch TV with your parents, you're not going to see yeah. commercials anymore. But like the worst thing that I had to sit through was they tried to convince us that because we were going to Dragon Con, um, was that The Big Bang Theory is a good show. They made us watch. Yeah. So many episodes. Yeah. I have a. PTSD from that experience. I, um, I don't want to talk about it, but I, I will admit that I have laughed at the Big Bang thing There's before. Some I'm going to put myself but, uh, out there. Yeah, but it it is a very uninspired uh, sitcom. You know what I mean? It is a sitcom in the like like eight, eight, cla- eight, eight, classic eighty sitcoms. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. E- maybe even older. I mean, maybe like yeah, I I bet if you watch the Mary Tyler Moore show, y- you would see enough. Oh, you, know, yeah. you know, similarities to be like, boy, they didn't try anything at all. Yeah. That guy, what's his name? Chuck, Chuck Lorre. That guy's the laziest fucking guy. Oh, yeah, Chuck Lorre. Uh, in oh, my God. Holly Weird. Yeah. I call it Holly Weird because. I'm going to make something very bland clever. and commercial that you can all watch. I don't know if this will make it onto the episode, but Natasha very often bums me cigarettes, which I really appreciate. You always bummed me when I was trying to vape well, and realizing that that just made me want to smoke yeah. more. You're like, uh, yeah, because I'm like, I'll be a, I'll be a bad influence. It's not a, yeah. it's fine with me. Well, I smoke like once or twice a week, and it's usually around social functions. Yeah, so I don't I'm, feel I'm kind of the same way. Well, I have a, I have a real, um, I have an idle hands problem. Same. You do too. Yeah, yeah where it's like. I don't know what to do with myself, but whatever I'm doing, whatever it is, Mm -hmm. whether it's work related or whatever, it's like, I need to get away from this for about 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. And what can you do? You know what I mean? Like, I can't read a chapter of a book very often in 10 minutes unless it's like a Game of Thrones super short. Yeah. You know, so it's like, but I can smoke a cigarette. Yeah. 
so I do that. Yeah, social media is my crutch in that sense. Like I'm just go like check and see what drama's going down. Well, right, but to but, me that's already mixed in. So like yeah. whatever work I'm doing, mm-hmm. even if I'm at like a job, like I'm about to start a job on Tuesday, I, I've already I'm already checking social media while I'm working. While you're working, and then it's like I need to get away from all of this. Yes, you do. And yeah. I don't smoke at work, but but I would if. If I were a younger man, I would just leave and go smoke. But yeah, it's like it's it's really for a long time that was the only way that you could get away. Like, well, with, and like, it's one of the only things that's like acceptable as a thing to do to get away from work, which yeah. is so weird because no one smokes anymore. No, you know what I it's mean? actually banned on all of our work campuses. So. Right, but but if you do still smoke, like you see those, like I mean, you know, I haven't lived over in that side of town in a long time, but where the Nike campuses. You see those poor fuckers oh, yeah. who are the the sad sacks that actually smoke mm-hmm. and work at Nike, and they have to walk like like a quarter mile, oh, I would yeah. guess, to like go smoke. Well, that I, is deliberate, you know. Yeah, yeah it's Providence, really... Providence. You know, you, seeing all the the nurses and the doctors out there smoking, you know, like trying to get away from the building because you have that restriction around. Yeah, there. but my point is, is that like it's still acceptable. That's like, oh, you need to go smoke. Yeah. Okay, well, then you can take a break. Exactly. But like. If you were just sitting at your desk looking at the internet while on a legitimate break, people would probably look askew at you. Oh, they do. Is, isn't that they weird? They already do. You know I know I mean? that. Yeah. yeah, this is like poor use of time. I've gotten into, I've gotten into a trouble, tr- massive trouble before from like you know using computer resources for uh, for effing around. Which thank God for uh, thank God for smartphones exactly. and uh, in for a while I was on a AT and T's unlimited data. So mm-hmm. I was like, all right, I you know I can just tap on this phone and not not have any of my web mm-hmm. my web um, activity logged through the house DNS right. server. That's what I have to do because they have PHI health restricted information, you know, like HIPAA, mm-hmm. so you can't access a bunch of web pages. So I just am always on my phone, kind of just like. Mm. Well, right, and so um, I was going to say something work related. Shit, I lost it. it was, I thought it was actually kind of an interesting point. Fuck. Oh well, go on. Bring back to it if we can. I hope I hope it, it bounces back. Oh, it's I was talking to to my lady friend about uh about work and it's 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 really weird how or it really bothers me and I think it bothers everyone that you know like work is such a fucking hustle and we like I think every employer knows they're not getting 8 hours of work out of all their employees. Oh yeah. But they have and to they're just pretend con- like they do. Well, they're just content with like owning you for eight hours. It's like, look, we know that you're probably only working five to six of these hours mm-hmm. or less, but we're fine with it as long as we can just tell you what to do for eight hours oh, yeah. a day, you know, 40 hours a week. Ooh, that bothers me. We need yeah. to change this, you guys. Yeah. I'm all about anarchist systems of business. I don't know enough about that, but. Or just uh, treating people on a. On a- not having this hierarchical, hierarchical, ugh, I'm butchering that word, mm-hmm. corporate structure where you have, um, you know, I mean, there is there is some benefits to management, but when you treat people like lesser than because of your status or come with the company, it just doesn't feel right to me. Yeah. Because we're all human beings and That's we all right. have brains. Yeah. And business people are dumb. That's what I think. Yeah. <laughs> Take that business people. Oh, was speaking of uh, dumb people and web activity, uh, one question I did have is one of the topics we talked about last time was just kind of batshit entitled fan theories going awry. Oh, yeah. And I'll, one question I, uh, that I have for you, Natasha, is has there been any newer develop- in the in the weeks it has been since our last conversation, has there been any newer developments in kind of similar... Um, Oh, in, in the Sherlock fandom? Well, not or, just, well, just Sherlock, uh, like I said, Sherlock <laughs> fandom, and, well, I think well, there haven't been any new episodes, but I think that was, because it was, that was a, that was a new occurrence yeah. in the, uh, right about the time when we, uh, our last convo. Any, uh, any new, uh, occurrences of that, of, you know, the same kind of thing with any sort of, um, online community? Oh, um, I haven't been as much on Twitter and stuff like that. Um, I know that the, Os- it's, it's always Oscar season, and, well, I mean, there was, the um, institutional racism of uh, Beyonce not winning the Grammys, which was was a you know that's Tumblr in a nutshell. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, but like uh, for I, I don't know I, my my new favorite blog continues to catalog 
the fallout from the Sherlock fandom that's still going on. And it's called uh, TLJC Schadenfreude. If you know how to spell that, just Google it. Um, that's a that's a that's a mouthful for, of a URL. That's I mean that's T L J C the John wait T J L C yeah the John Locke conspiracy Schadenfreude dot Tumblr dot com. Dang, that's, just a, that's just some, that, go there. That's some S E L there. Yeah, that's yeah. They decided to like start photoshopping um, anti abuse things onto fair characters. You know, they, they, I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> I haven't I haven't seen anything uh, much more interesting recently. Thank God. I've, it's been quiet in fandom. For me, uh, Star Wars fandom has gone dead before Celebration comes out. And, oh, yeah, yeah, there's a lot going on there. But and Celebration comes out later this year, uh, I imagine. Yeah, it's, the, the, it's year. the convention that they're going to have. Oh, okay, in, sorry. Uh, Orlando in April. Yeah, sorry. Um, what I've noticed though systemically is that I think I was talking to Garrett about this. There's a bleed through on all fandoms of. You know, we're talking a little bit about the identity politics, like kind of leftist mm -hmm. bleed through, but also now we're starting to see people that are tired of the Donald and will spend their time going over to other subreddits that like show up on our all on Reddit <laughs> and start uh, espousing really weird shit in the comment sections. Uh, Only obliquely related. Yeah. Uh, but they use it as a sort of uh, as a, uh, as a, as, yeah. or a sort of uh, a wedge point to start talking about oh, yeah. whatever whatever yeah, crack, I had a, crackpot I, right wing. I had a conversation with a guy. To. Yeah, it was like, uh, you know, dads are much more, uh, you know, connected and, and, and appreciative of their children and take care of them more. And I was like, are you trolling on this? What's going on here? He's like, no, I'm not. A, I'm not a progressive. Don't talk to me. Right. So you were talking about the whole notion of like, <laughs> is this guy joking around or not? Like, Pose law. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, do, can you tell if they are like, are they a troll or are they not? Uh, I think that the, I, I can't tell anymore. I can't, I can't tell at all. But that one Chapo episode about how the, the, uh, the alt-right kind of co-opted identity politics into stuff and, mm -hmm. you know, created this like, uh, backlash because we were talking about. I think we had talked a little bit about you, know, you are not so smart. Like we both had a love for that, right? And, it's a great podcast yeah. put out by uh, David uh, David Rainey. Um, uh, yeah, he's his voice. Yeah, David Rainey. Oh my God, he's he could put you to sleep. He's so good. He's like, sorry, he's got a really pleasing. <laughs> oh yeah, mellow you should voice. listen to it. You'll love it. Um, out, of, out of Hattiesburg, Mississippi. Yeah. Okay, all right. I know. I've I've noticed uh, Jeremy posting things about it. Oh I yeah, think. or maybe it was you. I don't I don't recall. But. I'm a huge fan. But his most recent series about the backlash effect. We were talking about that. I think. Okay. Do you, do you know what that's about? No, I don't. Know. What's a backlash effect? Backlash effect is I'm I'm the guy who doesn't know anything on the show. Yeah, you are. You are. No. The, you are the. the I'm, I'm the simple-minded uh, 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 person that that gets to ask questions. Yeah, so it's not a, embarrassed to ask questions. Yeah. Just give it to me straight, Doc. Yeah. Yeah. Like, you, yeah. You're the one who we you know turn to camera audience surrogate uh, ex, <laughs> uh, explainer. The backlash effect, I believe, is it has to do with. Trying to, it's when your attempts to try to correct someone's erroneous beliefs backfire, mm -hmm. and they double down and they oh, double down on them. Oh, such a waste of time. It is, yeah. for example, they, they they I believe this was coined in the mid aughts when a couple researchers were talking to people who vehemently believed that WMDs had been oh, yeah. found in Iraq, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, and that. It, and it's one of and, and but but it was a thing and what they noticed was that no matter because uh, people are like well just tell them the straight facts and the, you know and it, it's good it's the over reliance on facts or or truth or not and there's a thousand one per there's there's going to be a thousand one permutations on this kind of thing before um before like modern um our modern discourse changes in our view of like how people actually think but in this particular case. Uh, after when depending on how people were trying to were ostensibly corrected in their view of like no that's that didn't actually happen the the research the researchers found that certain people doubled down on their belief and believed it harder it's like nothing will nothing because of how our brain works and like our you know mm -hmm. because we it, it, it ain't a computer it's a gland it's a muscle cognitive right. dissonance is a bitch basically yeah, it is there's there there is no way to better re-cement a bad belief that uh, that's that is a, a deep well it's it's, it's got to be a belief that is deeply uh, tightly held you know tying into your identity mm -hmm. no better way to re-cement that in deeper than to directly attack it yeah so they they, they noticed that you know the research 
tried to correct you know tried to correct the record, but there was enough people there who um as a result of like saying like no you know you're wrong and all this stuff they said they switched into defensive mode and as a result of that believed even stronger after the interaction their previous erroneous belief yeah that is the backfire effect it's like how you the the mean the way that you try to correct someone can have the can make things worse yeah Yeah. and that's really interesting I actually had an argument. So the weird thing about that is, like, every once in a while, I'll have an argument with someone, and I'll get them to, like, at least acknowledge that they don't know what they're talking about. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, but then, like, I got in one a little bit ago about, about um, what was it about? The, the guy was the guy was making this stupid sort of libertarian argument about, about uh, how the freedom to not vote is more important than the act of voting itself. <laughs> Like, like, oh my God. which is ridiculous right and so i was started making these points and i kept pointing out facts and 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 it was it was a it was a uh it was a real life uh backlash effect mm-hmm. uh uh you know you know example in my life where i, I got to the end and i'm like oh this guy's just an idiot and i just need to let it go yeah <laughs> like, i think like, the, like there's uh, no hope for this the dude. conclusion of that and podcast series was oh sorry no i'm just saying it's just it, it's just a waste of my energy yeah it, it, and it was like you, you're better off and this is what i learned from the sort of what the quote-unquote dirtbag left is you're better off just trolling these assholes yeah than than trying to argue them based on on reason or mm-hmm. try and like show how you know we're, by your logic them which is the biggest waste of time oh yeah uh but trolling is a better weapon against them than yeah and well basically what what it is is like it, you're not ever going to target these people that are so inculcated in their beliefs you're going to go for the undecided right right and when it, when you do argue something you have to like i think he was saying like you have to you have to replace that belief with something of equal footing. So like a table that's imbalanced. You have to have a table leg that will prop them up just oh, I see in what the you're same saying. way yeah. as you're taking it away from them. Yeah, if they have like if they uh it's a, it, you can't like kick out a leg of their table. You can't kick out like a like a table leg or a leg of your stool because everything because they it it causes the human brain is so yeah, it'll <laughs> cause meltdown. The human brain so will so dislikes the gap or the unstableness that it will confabulate. Like I said, we're really good at coming up with crap on the, on the spot mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that you need to, if, that, but the correction will work if you give the, if you give people uh, sort of like, I guess not just a replacement, but almost like an out. If you give people like a, you know, like if you kick, you can't kick out a table leg out of their worldview without like replacing it right. with, uh, with something that they're, that, will function will like allow them to functionally um so that's interesting just you know make them feel good about themselves is really what it boils well so i got into another altercation it was probably a couple years ago but it was it was someone that was a very strident sort of like milton friedman style free market Mm. sort of person always the best yeah and Mm -hmm. they were making these points and i just said look like i think that you know and I kept saying that capitalism produces these inequities and blah, blah, blah. And we need to look at a Marxist critique. And then so he started arguing me with me like as though I were like this dyed in the wool card carrying communist. And I, I finally just said, look, dude, I'm just I'm just defending a Marxist critique of capitalism. That's it. Yeah. And that got him to stop and go, oh, like because he couldn't he couldn't cast me in that light of just. Yeah. You know, like he had to acknowledge that there were other intellectual traditions besides the ones that sort of exactly. Milton Friedman and other, uh, and that at least they're worth checking out. Yeah. You know what I mean? So maybe that's sort of an illustration of the difference, but I'm trying to figure it out. Cause I, I get into these arguments so rarely online yeah. that, well, it's, I think a lot of it's considered status quo, you know, because we do live in a capitalist system and people mm-hmm. want to kind of, uh, legitimize that belief in it. Um, but I think frequently. most people just don't think about it. You know what I mean? They have, they have some they have some commonly held beliefs uh about how they think the world should work and they they generally fall in the like capitalist neoliberal yeah sphere but they don't you know they're not like they don't get into the theory of it you know what i mean no. it's more just their sort of moral intuitions that are sort of driving it yeah yeah and they're informed by the system that we live in mm-hmm. anyway I don't know if I'm taking this too far afield, but no, I think this is a perfectly valid topic, uh, especially nowadays. Um, 
because we're dealing with I don't know, we're dealing with this paradigm shift where all of these kind of deeply held ideas about how the world worked are falling apart. <laughs> right. So I think so, at least. And in liberal politics, especially, yeah. you know, you're having this big rift between true leftists and, you know, liberals. Yeah. Or cent the more yeah, cent centrist liberals. Neoliberals. Right. Uh, and they, you know, they're having, you know, we're having this big fight about, you know, the basically how reality works. Yeah. You know, anyway. No, I think, yeah, it, it and I'm, it's, it's kind of good to see a little bit that we've gotten, and well, it's not good to see, obviously, the circumstances around it are pretty fucking terrifying and, and everybody wants to scream and run away and. I'm encouraged by it, to be honest I with think you. It, I think so too. It's nice to see that people, like, even myself as a very, I'm, I will be very admittedly, like, I, I wasn't ever involved politically because I felt it was just a big sham and mm -hmm. I think most people did. Um, Kayfabe. But, yeah. <laughs> But you can bring it back around to kayfabe. Yeah, but once that once that sham takes over and starts instituting really horrible executive orders, yeah, then you have to resist. It starts fucking up material reality. Exactly. Right. Which was kind of needed almost for to be honest, because we kind of let it sit for a long time. I'm sorry, I'm going to really dark territory. <laughs> it's okay. it's we yeah. live in dark times. Yeah, this, welcome, welcome to our world. Yeah. Um, I think part of it is, and I've mentioned this on previous episodes, but yeah, it's kind of like you know, this is it's almost the the natural result of four plus decades of depoliticized, like inactive, uh, inactive um, people were not politically active. No. No, and they were so cynical about the whole political process, you know. Yeah, I mean? absolutely. That, and, and they weren't wrong, you know what I mean? It yeah. really does seem like the same people uh, um, that that the fight they're having is it, uh, on the, especially the national political stage. Yeah, mm -hmm. is largely superficial, and that's why I don't know if that's why Jeremy was bringing in the comparison to professional wrestling no it works perfectly but, i think especially for like our, our our current times of conspiracy theories from each side you know everybody wants to believe in this kind of like like that everybody has like a three thousand foot view and is pushing the pieces across the chessboard yeah but that's the thing is which which is scarier that a secret uh secret all-powerful group are pulling the strings and controlling the outcomes of everything or that no one is, and yeah. that you know, God is perfectly happy in letting us screw everything up for ourselves, and it's kind of a thing where it is. And like I said, we can. Go, I mean, at some point, we really need to. Um, in fact, there's got to be people on here we can like bring in to talk to about this who have studied mm -hmm. this kind of stuff. But the getting it, you know, it starts getting into the me the mechanisms and the need. There, there's a need for the function that conspiracy theory provides. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's like I said, it because you know na your, uh, nature abhors a vacuum, uh, as yeah. as well does as more importantly, your brain hates it even more. That you will come up with, you know, mm -hmm. come up with why, you know, why there are uh, you know the, the things you know why everything it seems like it was controlled by somebody. It's like why that you know the, the kayfabe you see on TV is really you know it's 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 all controlled by a booker. It's controlled by yeah. Vince K, Vince K McMahon and well these days you know his daughter Stephanie and her husband Triple H, both of whom are on screen characters and were at in the. Um, you know, in the uh, in the crowd during uh, Linda McMahon's confirmation hearing for confirmation hearing for um, for the small business admin to the point where even like some certain senators were calling out were re you know dropping references mm -hmm. to uh, to the sh to uh, wrestling. But yeah, shifting on to I really need to come up with a little jingle for this segment. It's effectively our uh, our uh, our recommendations are. Uh, the more you know. Yeah. Have a little rainbow. In chime. <laughs> doom, 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 doom. Of like, okay, what have you been consuming uh, that you want to um, loudly crow about to everyone else to say, yo, check the shit out? 
Natasha, are you looking up what you want to recommend? Yeah, because okay. otherwise I'll butcher the Well, names. I've got a few things chambered. Okay. Um, maybe I'll do one or all. What do you want to do? Do you want to kind of go round robin or? Uh, I'd say just, unlo- uh, yeah, Garrett, you unload them. Mm-hmm. Okay. So two books first. Uh, they're the two most recent books that I've read. One is called Listen Liberal. It's by Thomas Frank. Uh, you might know Thomas Frank from his previous book called What's the Matter with Kansas? Um, I thought Listen Liberal was really good. He he's uh, he he's got a really good mind for what's going on with liberal politics in the United States and what's wrong with it. And uh, it really opened my eyes to a lot of things. Most notably, how bad uh, the the uh, Bill Clinton's two administrations were. They, that he was not a good president oh. if, if you hold liberal values. Yeah. It, it really it really shows that he didn't. He didn't really do dick for normal people. Yeah. Um, so I really liked that book a lot, um, and I highly recommend it. I devoured it. I read it in you know the course of two days, I would say, and uh, you know not two full days, but the, another book I read recently was called The Dispossessed. It's by Ursula Le Guin. Oh um, yeah. About who, halfway through it. Whose whose writing style I don't really like sync up with very well, like. Like I, I don't know a lot about science fiction, but like, like a, a sort of genre writer that I love that I think writes very beautifully is Ray Bradbury. Yes, who's his writing I connect to a lot. I do not connect to Ursula Le Guin's, but Ursula Le Guin's very smart. Mm-hmm. Portland's and, owned. Yeah, and she has this. You know, it, it, we're we're in a period of time I find very interesting where we're thinking about alternatives to, you know, our neoliberal sort of political yeah. and economic system, and this one shows. I think a fairly realistic um, anarchist society and shows you the the warts of that society. And and, and you can kind of look at that society in the context of a society kind of like what we live in now. Yeah. And kind of make make your decision on what you think you would prefer Mm -hmm. Um, from a mid 70s standpoint. From yeah, definitely from a mid 70s standpoint. So, like, I think a lot of people are going to will laugh at. You know how the tech doesn't move beyond like the telephone and the automobile. No, you know what I mean. But it's... FaceTime, that's about it. Yeah. Um, but I don't know that. I don't know that that matters. I, I really, I really enjoyed that book. Uh, even though, like I said, I don't connect with her writing style that well. She she writes in a sort of blunt way that mm-hmm. that I, doesn't grip me, doesn't keep me sort of attached. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I I really enjoyed the book. I think it's worth reading. Um, and then finally, the last thing I would recommend is a video series on YouTube by a philosopher named Robert Paul Wolf, and it's about uh-huh. it's about ideological critique. Um, he starts off with the views of a German sociologist called Karl Mannheim, um, who wrote a book called Ideology and Utopia. He he does a brief, I think maybe two lectures about ideology and utopia, and then he shows how people have not necessarily use that as a as a basis but have engaged in sub- substantive and interesting ideological critiques um uh of 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 various types uh mm-hmm. since then and it's about 10 lectures i think it's really interesting um and i think that for those who are sort of like me who are sort of politically minded and want to uh, look into those things more deeply. It's it's a very useful thing. But it's on YouTube. Awesome. It's free of charge. Robert Paul Wolf, uh, Ideological Critique. I will link it in the show notes. That's great. Thank you. I think my my only my two comments on that is one dispossessed is the I'm about halfway through. I think the 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 one issue that I had with it uh, about halfway through is that it does the mid seventy. I think eco. If the book Ecotopia did this too, there is a mid seventies, like positing, if not quite the ideal or the semi utopian societies, but there's a very there's like this kind of like colorless, uh, you know, ascetic austerity to everything, as if the um, like everything is very like stripped down, and it, especially in Ecotopia, like it's very gray uh, and like mm-hmm. unpainted and all that stuff, and it's kind of it. Um, there's not a um, there's not a sense of there's not a sense of like of like this th- that you want to have aesthetic joy brought about to the stuff it's always much more of a plane of like a stripped down plane right uh, mm-hmm. like like but I, like, like like even uh, that even in um you know like these you know you like said there these scarce times where like they're living like relatively hard scrabble life because they they have you know a different economic and social system 
it's at some point it's kind of like it's not going to look that gray because we you know we have real yeah. world examples of like people you know people you know will go about and will naturally ha- uh there will naturally bring about vibrancy unless it's yeah right and I, and I, but i think that the um in the in defense of the book i i think that the drabness was more um more a function of what became of the anarchists where where they were kind of forced to relocate to a certain place that was in its own nature drab Mm -hmm. but i don't think that the i don't think that the culture that they created was a drab culture i mean they talk about having playwrights and musicians and and traveling bands of people who come to entertain people but the 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 landscape itself was drab but i don't know that the society they the the society they built was a little bit limited because of the resources that they didn't have mm. uh-huh. that's my opinion anyway interesting i'd be happy to read that i think the and i think the thing the only kicker about li- listener liberal is that it came i think it was written written in like late 2015 mm-hmm. published early 2016 it kind it does like presage a lot of stuff that would that it's like from a couple things because I'm st- I'm starting to read it right now. A couple and like reading because I checked with I think Current Affairs has a pretty good um, response slash review of it. Mm-hmm. Mentioned it's a it, not, it doesn't it's kind of like it is. It's a take from how things were like a, like about two years ago because it but it doesn't really bring as much emphasis emphasis into like the Bernie campaign, or because it's way before the election about how. The election kind of helped break a lot of things. It kind of like helped point to like yeah. what were the problem was with it. Mm-hmm. The other kick in, but one of the points that current affairs brings up is that um, he that he idealizes unions a bit too much and does not bring in the fact about how like what um, some there were some definite problems with major American unions mm-hmm. in the seventies. That's very true. And um, that that is not uh, that is not the. Um, it was one of the reasons why, uh, the, you know, unions are always for like any, you know, like bring, you know, w- you know, any sort of like military action meant manufacturing bring, meant bring it on. Well, and I think that Frank, I think, I think I agree with you that Frank seems to not have a lot of forward looking, um, where do we go from here sort of, mm-hmm. sort of ideas. He's one of those people that criticizes contemporary culture from the purview of the past. Right. Um, and, and uh, I think he sort of runs out of, I mean, he's a historian, right? So yeah. he kind of runs out of gas when it comes to the point of, well, okay, well, now what do we do? Yeah, he, yeah. Is, he is an academic. He has a PhD in history. But I think his, I think what I found most enlivening about it was that his his criticism of the past and then how it got us kind of where we are yeah. was, um, it was elucidating to me because I, I had always thought of Bill Clinton as like a sort of mixed bag president and 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 after reading that book i feel pretty convinced that he was a shitty president especially if you hold liberal or left-wing values right yeah we were relatively young when and that was the big sort of takeaway from me and then and then he showed he showed the arrow from which clinton's bad ideas and bad policies buttressed more in both the bush administrations and the obama administrations Mm -hmm. and and then he couldn't get to this because the election hadn't happened yet. But basically what we're, a lot of us are talking about now, which is like how all those mistakes of the past paved the way for a moronic yeah. pseudo dictator to come in and abuse, abuse the things that the more or less benevolent leaders that preceded them. The surveillance state. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think that that's a really important Especially for a general audience, you know, yeah. I think yeah. a general audience will pick up that book and go, "Oh shit!" You yeah. know what I mean? Like, yeah, we need more people to do that, especially people that have kind of fond memories of that period that mm-hmm. tried to kind of mm-hmm. like do so in the Hillary Clinton campaign, right? Yeah. Um, you, uh, Tasha, you are up. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, um, podcast wise, I just on the subject of unions and stuff like that. I'm listening to Crime Town. Have you heard that one? Not familiar. It's no. by the creators of the guys that did the Jinx documentary on HBO about Robert. Oh yeah, loved it. Yeah, Robert Durst is that his name? The yeah. So they did a one about uh, the history of Baltimore and um, the mafia and how that kind of was like in infiltrated the business, everything. The whole the whole city was basically controlled by just 
you know, crime families. Nice. And it's a really, yeah, it's a really great exposition into it with real people and, and interviews from the actual guys and like these wise guys kind of types. I've never been into that kind of, you know, good fellas, like the Godfather stuff, mm -hmm. but it was, it's a really great retrospective. Um, true, true crime show. Exactly. That and stalkers are both good true crime shows. Okay. Um, uh, as for media, I, this is going to go back against the curve because we mentioned this previous podcast, but uh, I read Roadside Picnic. And All right. I loved that book so much. And I you, it just, if if you like Fallout, if you like anything that has to do with this kind of, this kind of set, kind of like... Um, post-apocalyptic. Post-apocalyptic, dystopian, but everything is like what we have in our world, but there's just stuff that's mildly off. Like Alan Curtis was kind of exposing on his, in his um, yeah. documentaries about, you know, and I've been watching Century of the Shelf too, and that's been really great, like... Basically, the the idea that you know Russians grew up knowing that things were kind of off, they were wrong. Like there was a lot of um, you know obviously propaganda about stuff that was happening, and they knew that that was happening, but so they couldn't really believe in the media, and it continues yeah. to be a problem today, where they know that things aren't real, but they just you know are going to keep it. We live in a fake world, but we don't know. What the with, what the remedy for yeah, the fake or what the real is. world, world yeah. is? So that book is really great. It's it's very nihilistic, but um, in the sense you know that the stalkers have to go into the zone and they're doing this to you know basically support their families, and then they end up, you know, the main character has a daughter that is mutated because of the fact that he went into the zone, and there's this whole kind of thing around that, you know. Golly. It's really, oh, it's heartbreaking, but it's really good. It, yeah, it led to, uh, have you seen the film it was based on? I have not yet, no, I'm going to watch that next. Uh, it's, uh, Roadside Picnic by the Strogatsky Brothers mm -hmm. would later, was used, was the other, uh, uh, the other film that Tarkovsky, the other like Russian, Soviet sci-fi film that Tarkovsky did. He, you know, did yeah. Solaris mm -hmm. in 1972, came out later in like 1979 with Stalker. Which, um, which much of very kind of a different take on it, and, but also uh, led its name. It, it, Stalker, the film, was much more dreamlike. Yeah, deliberately, it's, it's gorgeous. Yeah, it's like like I just want to chime in for a second. Oh I, yeah, absolutely. I watched it recently, and that is if you are a film buff. Uh, that is a beautiful movie. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. No, no, it's perfectly. It, it segues into my other recommendation, which is a movie that um, a Ryan Johnson has credited as being one of the influences for the new Star Wars movie he's working on. Mm -hmm. um, it's called uh, Letter Never Sent. It's from 1959. It's a Russian film. And I kind of put it on one night, just kind of wanting to watch it just in the background and not really follow because I knew the story. Stories about a group of archaeologists that go into the Russian, like, Siberian wilderness and basically looking for diamonds. Ah. And they find diamonds and they're really excited because they can bring these back. And, you know, there, there's a lot of what called socialist realism in it, basically, mm -hmm. where the, the idea of the struggle of the people kind of being like put into a small group, like as a kind of representation. Interesting. And the nature, but it, 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 it then turns into a man versus nature movie. And the cinematography in that movie, I have, I was completely blown away because this was making 1959 when with minimal uh, resources and it's just overwhelming and beautiful like there, there's a whole kind of thing around a wildfire and mm -hmm. just the setting and like a sweet back so the cinematography, cinematography of that is is amazing no, uh, uh 50s and 60s russian films are absolutely awesome i watched one the other day called v you can watch it on youtube i'm sorry i don't mean to sound no, 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 again viy v um it's kind of silly in parts i mean it's basically like a folk tale mm -hmm. um that google like turned into a novel and then uh, but they, the like the inventiveness of like when you're working with a little bit, yeah, what people end up doing with it, yeah. There's there's a sequence in the last 15 minutes or so of the movie that is incredible. I loved it, so I, I don't know. And there's a lot of that stuff that's just on YouTube for yeah, free. It's so, all on YouTube for so free. So check it out. Yeah, you can you can see uh, a subtitle. You can watch Stalker. I think both Stalker and probably Solaris mm -hmm. subtitled. Sometimes the subtitles are in other languages, but mm -hmm. you can see the whole thing uh, if you so if you uh, hunt on YouTube enough. Yeah. Excellent. Um, and thank you for that, that's all. That's what you got. Yep. Mm -hmm. Sweet. Thank you very much. My okay. recommendations are uh, saw this last night. There is a documentary um, documentary plane. It's still going on all the art of the all the out all the art houses. It's put out by Am uh, by. Amazon was it Amazon Movies? I think is their imprint. It's like Amazon has has a distribution house now uh -huh. called. It is a American, Swiss, French, and Belgian film called "I Am Not Your Negro," 
taken from an unpublished man, written from an unpublished manuscript that James Baldwin did in the late seventies. It is a documentary kind of splicing together um, Samuel L. Jackson doing voiceover, reading Baldwin's work, mm -hmm. reading the, the the notes that he was making uh, when he had set out to start writing this book about kind of like mixing the bio uh, about his relationship in with the biographies of Malcolm X, Medgar Evers, and um, and Martin Luther King Jr. But it's kind of a thing where it cuts through a, a lot of everything. It, it, it it cuts through a lot of it, like everything from like archival interview footage. Like there's a lot of like color video of, of of James Baldwin going on the Dick Cavett show. And it's very weird to see like late late sixties Dick Cavett. Also, you know, talk, talking at, at the at a Cambridge debate club, or um, you know, on, television interviews from the early sixties. But also gets into say it'll talk about like uh, civil rights struggles in the sixties, and then it'll cut to say. Black Lives Matter events mm -hmm. and then cut back again and just kind of like just in, you know, tying together a lot of stuff. It is it is extremely powerful, powerful. It is very good. It's one of those things where it is, for example, it's screening in Portland at the Hollywood Theater and the Hollywood Theater on certain nights will like, you know, they will they will sell out like four showings all day. That's great. It's yeah, it's called I Am Not Your Negro. It was probably with it'll probably be on stream. If you haven't don't have a chance to see it. It's in two theaters in Portland. It'll probably be show up on streaming within a few months. Um, for, for the other uh, two books, one is called Rules for Revolutionaries, How Big Organizing Can Change Everything by Becky Bond and Zach Exley, who were both, they were both kind of like, um, let's say digital organizers for the Bernie 2016 com campaign. And that's kind of like their update of Saul Alinsky's rules for radicals. Only this one is much more about, it's not about necessarily the particulars of the campaign. It's more about here. There's a lot of like data organizing in there of like, how do you, uh, you know, using like open source software and like, uh, you know, a, you have like a hundred, you have a hundred thousand volunteers who are really wanting to help. How do you organize that with, primarily volunteer staff mm -hmm. like and you know how do you know and like you're talking about how why that they found out that they could that f i think maybe four you know three or four committed volunteers could do the work that a paid staffer could which means you know if you have endless volunteers who are like yeah hell yeah you know, who believe in the movement you don't have to pay some you know a 22 year old uh kid out of a northeastern college a lot of money to help do this campaign stuff yeah mm -hmm. it is it's it's a great book because it's uh and it, it, it there's a, there is far more project management talk in there because it's kind of a thing of how do they figure out you know how do you get a working how do you get a working email system how do you you know how do you get like a working um phone dialer where you don't have access to say some of the you know either like expensive software or custom software coders and it just and it's it's definitely worthwhile it's called rules for revolutionaries put out by uh Chelsea Green. Yeah, I think that's an interesting I, I think that's the challenge that we're in on the left right now is mm -hmm. is organizing because mm -hmm. we've just lost the thread on that so much. You know, the old styles of protests and stuff are can be effective but a lot of times they're not. And uh, how do we how do we get people mobilized? I think is a huge question right now. Yeah. Uh, excellent. And the the other book I have is it's a couple years old. It's called Economics, uh, E C O N O M I X: How Our Economy Works and Doesn't Work in Words and Pictures. It is a great kind of similar. It's a mix of like a history and an essay, similar to like Larry Gonick's Cartoon History of the Universe. Only this is it's put out by uh, Michael Goodwin with art by Dan E Burr. And um, Abrams, what is it? Abrams Comic Arts put out. It came out about 2014. If you go to economicscomics.com, there is that's where they're that's where they have like sample pages and there's a couple up updates in there and there's like an author's blog. They have a special section where like they give away for free like the chapter, the little intro chapter on like Adam Smith. the be The benefit of the book is that it clears up. It gives you. Because my 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 thing is like I I have great difficulty reading about the history of economics mm -hmm. in pure text because even though you know, cause that I have engineers training economic jargon just kind of like it's difficult to get into yeah, yeah it just goes over my head the problem is this the the benefit is that this teaches all the stuff uh, but it also uses doc, you know examples and mm -hmm. you know just comic pictures and it, like I said it illustrates it greatly and explains a lot of things 
So like I said, um, economics are how our economy works and doesn't work in words and pictures by Michael Goodwin and Dan Eber. And last but not least, um, a band we have previously mentioned on here, Zeal and Ardor. They just put out a new album, which is best described as a mix of um, Field Hollow, Negro Spiritual, and um, Death Metal. Wow. I love that combination. It's pretty crazy. That's great. Yeah. It's um it is it is a uh, it's a heck it is a heck of an act. All right, uh, that wraps it up for this episode of uh, giving the mic to the wrong person. Do you guys want to give your credits again, or like, where, well, let's just say if anybody wants to get hold of you, or where are you on the internet, or yada yada yada? Yeah, I'm on ashesforfoxes.tumblr.com, and also uh, my email address is uh, tfoxley at gmail.com. Um, I'm at comrade Garrett, uh, two R's, two T's, and Garrett on Twitter, I don't tweet that much, but, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I don't know. Be my friend. Maybe I'll tweet more. Mm-hmm. And uh, you can go find Honky Tonk Union, one of my bands, www.honkytonkunion.com, or uh, the Davenport Brothers. I think it's ReverbNation.com backslash either the Dav Bros. I did this last time, or <laughs> or just Dav Bros. Uh, I think it's the Dav Bros. Nice. But... Uh, um, I think that's the kind of the extent of my internet presence. Mm-hmm. All right, and once again, you can always find the show at. Oh, let's see, here we go. Uh, <laughs> up until they close down, and up until the website shuts down, which is rumored to happen sometime this year, SoundCloud.com/slash giving the mic. Um, you can email us at giving the mic at gmail dot com, and most importantly, find us on Facebook, uh, Facebook dot com slash giving the mic, all lowercase uh, lowercase one word. Um, our theme is by the mysterious breakfast cereal on SoundCloud, and a uh, special shout out for uh, to Michael Pomrose at Entertainment Unlimited for uh, helping me edit this ungainly thing. Mm. Uh, Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. As as Sorry. always, like I said, uh, like you know, uh, like, share, and subscribe because you know hitting that subscribe button if you can really makes a difference, and and um, you know. Post a link or two on your social media just to get you know. So we have, you know, it's, it's the uh, the uh, the eternal struggle of trying to get more people than just the folks who personally know us to listen to a thing. Hi mom. Yep. Yeah, and my mom is not listening, so oh. I deliberately refuse to tell my parents about this. So <laughs> <laughs> probably a good idea. Yeah, it's, it's it, you know it's a, it's a, yeah it'd be akin to like you know you know sending the ur the URL to your live journal to your own parents. Even even if <laughs> oh, I yeah. even if I told my folks I'd really like you to listen to this, I don't think they'd listen to it. Yeah, that'll happen. Anyway, thank you, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, uh, and we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye. Editing services provided by Entertainment Unlimited. Visit us at euavp.com. A single, a single tossed off line, uh, line in the verse. Um, got the, about Star Trek. Got them so much money from it being used mm-hmm. from their stuff being used in all the J.J. Abrams. Um, reboot movies. Yeah, right, I'm yeah sure they're J.J. Uh, J. J. Abrams is obsessed with that song. He's actually obsessed with sabotage. Sabotage. You know what? Because Kirk yeah. used to say sabotage. sabotage. Oh, did he? Yeah. yeah a great it was. It was. Him, it uh, was Shatner. Art, it was pure Shatner. Art, I pronounce it sabotage. Wow, that's wild. Yeah. I um. But they have used the other, yeah. They've used the other song too because he loves the Beastie Boys. Uh, he actually, I love. The there's Beastie a character Boys. in The Force Awakens that's named um, 
Bad uh, Rock. No, no, L O Nasty. He's one of the guys that dies uh, in the in the trench run. You guys. Yeah. That's cute. Yeah. He also he also casts his favorite his best friend from high school in every movie he makes. I'm a big Abrams fan. does. Yeah. It's um. Well, he likes if anybody needs any. <sighs> Greg Grunberg. He's been in um. He was in. Did you ever watch Alias or anything like that? No, I never watched Greg, Alias. Okay. Greg Grunberg was the was the the chunky bearded rebel uh resistance pilot. Yep. Pilot Snap in, in Force Awakens. He's actually the kid hero oh. of the new Aftermath books, which is cool. Like his mom is like a like a fucking badass. Snap Wexley. Hey, Snap hey, Wexley. Jeremy. Yeah. W- uh, will you grab my soda while you're up? Thanks, buddy. Anyway, but yeah, he um, he immortalized him as a as a character that has three books written about him. So. His name is Snap Wexley. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That sounds like one of those like seventies private detectives. Oh like, yeah. From a TV show. Yeah. And the show's called like Snap to it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Snap Wexley is a is a. Snap Wexley. Yeah. Private Eye. Private Eye. Yeah. What what era though? Is it like a uh, this? I think it's the time like the Rockford Files and mm-hmm. and and shows like that. I'm I'm saying like mid to late seventies. Yeah, I like the seventies for that because it's always swanky. There's always like chicks with long hair. Mm-hmm. And, like... and, well, they all their hair is like crazy. Oh yeah, no, it's Farrah Fawcett age, right? You know, like flip. Mm-hmm. Charlie's Angels. I don't even know what you call that stuff. Flip curls. Was uh, that... it's it's yeah, it's kind of like a it's just a blowout basically where you mm-hmm. you, you but feather feathered it. Mm-hmm. yeah. So I did my hair like that once, and they're wearing never like again. they're wearing like like a satin sort of, but it like billows. Like, oh yeah, you know what I'm talking yeah. about. Well, they have that. They have they have this but like it's obsession. 70, so no one's wearing a bra. Well, sort of like they uh, had that, like, that whole like kind of dark shadows obsession with like Victorian like wear, but it was like 70s. So it yeah, was, like like, like so the colors silky. were all funky too. Yeah. They were like a mm-hmm. like a like a bright blue, mm-hmm. which is a, a good Victorian would not do. Mm-hmm. It's yeah, not, it's too immodest. So I just what like a painted painted woman would wear. My favorite seventies show to watch is Columbo. Oh, Columbo's excellent. Yeah, it really. As long as, really stay, is. As, long as you stay in the seventies and don't go later. Yeah. Well, I don't know enough about it for that, but I but the Columbo is. Oops, sorry. It's such a weird show because you know what happens, like, yeah. and it's still really interesting to watch. Yeah. Like the who does his process is so good. He's just, he's just such a charming actor. Mm-hmm. I guess is really what it boils yeah, down to. Yeah, that one glass eye looking off yeah. in a direction. Uh, uh, just one more thing. Oh, just one more. Thing. I like the fact that even on um, even on uh, Tiny Tunes, they would have <laughs> they did they didn't. Tar- it was one of those um, even you know pre Animaniacs and like heavy reference and reference heavy mm-hmm. jokes. They would have like Buster Bunny would do an entire bit. Uh, as Columbo, uh, as Columbo, like with like with like you know odd go odd eyeball and. Uh-huh. Um, Odd eyeball and trench coat and method of delivery. <laughs> it's similar to when they had, and then Kevin Pollock sued them because that was his his, <laughs> his shtick. This well, uh, well, I think God, I think this is all Rob Hawson. Oh my God! But um, I'm kidding around. Well, they no, also the, great. the other thing I've forgotten that name. The uh, there's also the there was one of the, much like it was like even more so than The Simpsons because I think that Tiny Toons was was aimed. Mm-hmm. The Simpsons was definitely like broad, you know. N- um, prime time broad audience aimed but what they would you know it's still factor in you know insane amounts of literary and cultural references mm-hmm. right and and that's the thing is like kids grow you know i grew up on the anime and freakazoid especially oh, too. i loved freakazoid yeah it was uh, so there was lots of good jokes in freakazoid yeah. freakazoid i think was the, from watching that that was like the one because that was their post uh animaniac show that was mm-hmm. like the one time where i think i think it kind of f- started to fall apart yeah and they just had to, they just said oh the hell that would just, we'll just make batman uh we'll just make we'll focus on batman cartoons mm-hmm. but the um oh, anyway. the that was the cool thing about tiny tunes is that it was really was kind of the first um like the modern because it I mean, some of those, at the same, you know, as it coexisted with um, with The Simpsons, but Tiny Toons would draw on like the Warner Brothers classic, like Hollywood referencing, right? But you, but, it, but in this case, deliberately shooting over the heads of like, their entire children, yeah. Yeah. The children. On, the, my, my one of my favorite examples, not only of was it the two parter about Citizen Citizen <laughs> Kane that they did? That was that. that. Was Wasn't that intense. a two part episode? I don't think that was a two part. Okay. That was when yeah, when 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 uh, when Montana Max. Did the thing, and they actually had they they did straight. Like I said both. Uh, yeah, it was Citizen Kane being enough thing for the kind being a um a high enough a high enough goal or um 
a big enough icon so that both Simpsons writers and and uh, and and Tiny Toons writers both are like we need these plots in our in our respective shows. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The best the best dig that I ever saw um, ever saw Tiny Toons do was, and this is entirely because I think they figured out that Tress McNeil. Um, also, you know, who, you know, pr- who played Babs on Tiny Toons, uh, Dot on Animaniacs, oh, yeah. and many, many secondary characters on was, The Simpsons. Yeah, okay. She was, if you remember, uh, you have seen her before, because do you remember the... Uh, did weird she do a- Troy McClure? Just kidding. Uh, hey, hey, you know, depending on your age, everybody did Troy, Troy McClure. <laughs> if, if, well, do you remember the Weird Al's video for Ricky? Their, the kids take on Mickey only it was it was the no, I love Lucy I, with the black white. I, black I white. remember the song, but I don't remember the video. The video, well, in the video, she plays Lucy. Oh, nice. Oh, which I did not know oh, for really years, watch. and it's just and it's but and it's kind of it's it's almost like shocking. I like, realized, dude, that's trust me. You're like, oh my god, that's what she actually looks like. Um, the but the best poll they ever they they ever did on Tiny Toons was because they found out Trust McNeil could do Jane Fonda. They had an entire thing where she was. Where she was, she was Babzarella. Oh, I remember that. And nice. it was the thing was like, there's no very way. vaguely. Yeah, there. Uh, and it's I, I'm, I've been and trying. That's kind of a racy movie, Barbarella. Oh, it is. Dude, I mean, no, that for was the time anyway. That was I think it was originally released as an X or something. Mm-hmm. I'm not surprised. I mean, there was a little organ she gets in that makes her have orgasms. That yeah. was in the late '60s. Yeah. Pretty pretty racy for a you know mainstream film. Yeah, and it's uh, and uh, you know who knew what. Um, that's all I, I remember I, about Barbarella. Well, by yeah, the way. Or, or the fact I'm that usually I, high when I watch it. So. Yeah. yeah, or but this thing watching it now, it's like wow, this is slow as shit. Yeah, it's kind of nothing like, happens. Yeah, it's the, the it's, speaking it, of watching high. Sorry, <laughs> no, I don't, no, go right ahead. Uh, one of my favorite comedies of all time, and this is because of when I came of age, mm-hmm. uh, is Wayne's World. I oh, love yeah. I love Wayne's World, and me and my lady Mackenzie Thompson, a uh, friend of the show, right, former guest, uh, watched it stoned on Friday, and I've never. As many times as I've seen that movie, I've never seen it stoned. Oh, and it was such a fun experience. It's a new treat. Yeah. It, I think it's the it is the second best Saturday Night Live film besides uh, Blues Brothers. Yes, Blues yeah. Brothers yeah. is the gold standard because I think my personal, I put up, I hold up Blues Brothers as probably one of my top three favorite like uh, comedies ever. Oh yeah. yeah, and but in the subgenre that is SNL, I think that or SNL related, I think that. Um, I agree with Wayne's you, by Worlds. The way. Wayne's World. Wayne's Worlds is um, its sequel, of course, not as much. Even though they, they did try to do some different jokes, much like the Bill and Ted sequel, just, mm-hmm. uh, which even diverged from the original. Far away. We, we, could, mm-hmm. we at one point we need to do an entire episode about um, the second Bill and Ted movie. Oh yes, please. I would love to. <laughs> I'm into I love that. that movie. I'm into that. There's things I like about the second Wayne's World, like more than the first. But I, I do think I, the first uh, as a whole document uh, survives better you know what i mean indeed yeah, it does. um and you are listening to giving the mic to the wrong person i am your host jeremy joining it's been a uh, it's been a little bit of a time since our last recording session but wanted to bring back my two <laughs>